Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to the fourth and final class on understanding Jesus. We are about to cross the virtual finish line together, and it has been my pleasure having you all on board this incredible ride. However, this does not have to be the end, but a beginning, the beginning of a newfound desire in your heart to understand Jesus. In Luke chapter 6, beginning in verse 17, it reads, He, meaning Jesus, went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. What an amazing scene. Could you imagine how awesome a phenomenon this must have been? I mean, imagine people trampling on one another, stepping on each other's toes saying, excuse me, I'm sorry, uh, pardon me. I just need to touch Jesus because power was just oozing from him and healing every last one of them. I would have loved to be there, wouldn't you? Let's pray that as we study the scriptures to understand Jesus as the Lamb of God, that we will get in touch with him and that the power of his Holy Spirit would come from him and heal us all. Let us pray. Our Godfather, thank you so much for this time. Thank you so much for this day and all that you have filled it with so far. I pray that you'll continue to be with us, God. Continue to be with me. I pray that you'll remove me out of the way and fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I could uh, help everyone here tonight understand Jesus a whole lot better. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Gonna share my screen here. All right, as I alluded to a moment ago, um, this doesn't have to end here. I wanna encourage you all to keep doing what you're doing. Keep reading and studying God's word. They say the Bible, B-I-B-L-E, is an acronym for basic instructions before leaving earth. We will all have to leave earth someday and God left us his word you know, some instructions to help us navigate life before we leave this plane. I know I might be dating myself, but in the 1980s, there was this um, series on, it was called The Greatest American Hero. And it featured this guy who plays a teacher on the far left here of your screen. His, his name was Ralph and he's a high school teacher. And him and his FBI buddy, they're out somewhere and they had a close encounter of an interesting kind. This UFO uh, came down and beamed them a box with a special, one of those superhero suits and an instruction manual, as you will see in the middle uh, frame there. And at first he's very reluctant. He feels like he can't do this, but they're giving him this charge. They say, hey, you gotta do this. You need to save this planet from destruction. So he reluctantly takes that charge. And as he's making his way back to the school bus to meet his students, he drops his instruction manual. And you could see it there lying on the ground on, on that third frame. So, 
on the far left screen, this is him flying without the instruction manual. And in the middle, he's like running into uh, brick walls. And if you watch the series, he's running into all kinds of things. Why? Because he did not have his manual. And there was actually one episode where he did find a manual. I I've searched for it everywhere. I just couldn't find it. If you find it, please um, send it to me. Let me know how I can get access to it. But in one episode, he finds the manual and he reads it. And before you know it, he's flying straight. He's not crashing into any more walls. You know, everything is good. I mean, look at that third frame. He has his uh, instruction book. He's reading it. Just looking at it, this makes me feel at peace, makes, gives me this sense of calm. So in the same way, we need to read God's word. This is his instruction manual. This is his basic instruction before we leave earth to help us navigate uh, through life. Does that make sense? All right. So understanding Jesus part four, can I understand Jesus as the Lamb of God? We're going to begin in John chapter one, verses 29 to 31. It says the next day, he, meaning John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose, I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. Now, John had a good understanding of messianic prophecies. And John is possibly getting this from Isaiah chapter 53, verses 7 to 10. It's, it says, he was oppressed and afflicted. It's talking about the Messiah. Yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. There it is. And as a sheep before its shivers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his uh, generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people. Transgression is sin. Uh, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. So again, John understood this and he sees Jesus. He says, that's the lamb of God who's taken away the sins of the world. And that's what we're going to look at tonight. So we're going to begin uh, with the last supper. This image that you see here is where the upper room, uh, this is the upper room where Jesus would have taken his uh, disciples for the last supper. Again, this is not the actual room, but this is a room in the general area. So it would have looked something like this. And the reference is Mark 14, verse 15. So we're in Matthew 26. I'm going to read verse 20 to 25. It says, when evening came, he was reclining at the table with the 12 while they were eating. He said, I assure you, one of you will betray me. Um, we think of the Last Supper. Uh, when we think of the Last Supper, we often imagine Jesus and his disciples sitting around a modern table with upright dining chairs with their feet underneath, kind of like the tables we sit at today. Um, this is the scene portrayed by Leonardo da Vinci in his famous painting. However, Jews and Romans did not sit up at a table, but rather they reclined on couches or cushions around a low table. So it would have looked like this. Okay, this is a stick figure image. Um, there is the table and 
uh, Jesus would have had the host uh, seat there, uh, reclining, and they would have leaned on their with their left arm and reach with their right arm to take uh, food from the table. Uh, next to him was Judas and, and John and Peter would have been on the other side. And this is why in John chapter 13, Jesus was easily able to go and wash his disciples' feet because their feet would have already been extending out. Also, we know that Mary washed Jesus' feet when he was having a meal with one of the Pharisees in John chapter 12. So she would have easily had access to his feet and begin to wash them. Deeply distressed, each one began to say to him, surely not I, Lord. He replied, the one who dipped his hand with me in the bowl, he will betray me. The son of man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, his betrayer replied, surely not I, rabbi, you have said it, he told them. So we, one after the other, the apostles asked Jesus, surely not I, Lord. What did they refer to Jesus as? They referred to Jesus as their Lord. But what happens when they get to Judas? Uh, Judas asked, surely not I, rabbi. You know what this means? This means that Judas never made Jesus Lord. To Judas, Jesus was just his rabbi, his teacher. And I think this, there's a lesson for us here. We need to um, have Jesus as a rabbi, um, but he must also be Lord, okay? He just can't be our rabbi. Jesus needs to be Lord of our life. I want to share a bit of my story. So in the 12th grade, I was praying for God to lead me to a college. I was raised Catholic, and I was pretty religious, fairly. And I remember going on to my knees and asking God to lead me to the college that he um, has in mind for me, the one that he wants me to go to. And he had a much bigger plan than academics, because once I got into Hunter College in Manhattan, I was met by some brothers, some Christians from the church that I attend. And at first I wasn't interested, you know, two guys came up to me, asked me to say a Bible, and they were talking to me about God and Jesus, and, and I kind of blew them off. However, later on, I was met by another gentleman named Adam, and he was, you know, tall gentleman, well-spoken, there was, there was just something about his presence I was just drawn to. And I remember Adam asking me to come to a college devotional, a campus devotional that, Hunter, that was being hosted at Hunter College. And I told him, you know, yes, I, I, I'll attend. And he said, well, if you'll attend, uh, give me your keys. And I said, my keys? No, I don't need to give you my keys. I, I'm a man of my word. I, I say, I'm gonna come, I'm gonna show up. So I had, later on that day, I was spending some time with some friends and then I left them to go to this Devo. Would you believe when I got into my car and I turned the ignition on, my car started to malfunction. Um, there was sparks, there, there was smoke and I couldn't get it to start. I believe it even started to rain and I did not make it to this campus devotional they were having. And it struck me, I just thought to myself, hmm, why is it when I'm trying to do something good that all of a sudden my car's not working, it's smoking, it's raining. And so I, it was as though some spiritual force, some presence, some evil force was just trying to stop me from doing something that was actually good. But I pushed through that and I met Adam for a few studies and we started studying the Bible. Now, as a teen, I, I was doing okay. I had a car, I had a girlfriend at the time, but I still felt this inner void. There was a God void there. And as I began to study the Bible, God's word, I felt that that void started to get filled. 
And I remember learning through the scriptures that the more you love God, the more you love Jesus, the more you love others. And I remember going to my mom and telling her that I love her and she thought that I was on drugs, okay? Because that's not something that we grew up saying to each other. And, but now I say it more often, whenever I speak to my mom, I'll say, mom, I love you. I always try to close that conversation with an I love you. And I remember trying to share scriptures with her, Matthew 6, uh, 25 to 27, you know, where it says, uh, therefore I tell you, Jesus speaking, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear is not life more than food and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And I'm sharing this with my mom, saying, Mom, if God could take care of these birds, could you imagine how much he'll take care of you, who's his daughter? And at that point, my mom felt like I really lost it because not only did she think I was on drugs, here I am comparing her to, to birds. So my whole family thought I was going crazy. And I had someone very close to me says, okay, we're going to try to get you back. And I'm thinking, get me back? Where did I go? I'm just changing my lifestyle, you know, stopping sex before marriage, the lying, the stealing. But they weren't used to that. They wanted the old me back because it was too radical um, how I was changing, how the word of God was changing me from the inside out. So they actually wanted to perform witchcraft in order to get me back. And I struggled. There was a point where I was really confused. And um, I, I met a young lady on that campus. And um, there was something, again, about her aura. She says, don't worry. If God wants you, he'll get you. And I remember that just struck me like a ton of bricks. It's like, if God wants me, he'll get me. And I was like, wow, so simple and yet so profound at the same time. And I remember taking these emotions to uh, the brothers and we were praying together. And the praying was so intense. The, the brother who reached out to me, Adam, his praying was so intense. And as he was praying, I actually broke down dropped on the floor and I started crying. And let me tell you, when I was crying, I felt like a legion of demons just were expelled. They were cast out, they were exercised from me. And I just felt lighter. And I remember asking Adam, say, Adam, why me? And then he said, because Jesus loves you. And oh, I started to bawl even more, I was crying and feeling lighter at the same time I was repenting, I was changing. And I remember as I studied some more, I'm just going home on the subway and looking around at the people in the train station with their headphones on and their reading materials. And I was just thinking to myself, if these people don't know what I know, they're in trouble. And from the looks of them, not to judge them, but from the looks of them, there's a good chance that they do not know what I know. And I just felt the weight of the world once again on me. And like that greatest American hero, I feel like I had the manual and I needed to get myself right in order to make a difference. And shortly thereafter, I was baptized on June 1st, 1992, 29 years ago last month. Now, Back to our narrative here. So we're going to look at John's account. What's interesting is the place of honor was to the left of the host. This is where Judas was lying. The head of Jesus would have been in the breast of Judas, making the seating arrangement an unspoken appeal for friendship and intimacy. Jesus dipped the bread in the common dish, then leaned back and gave it to Judas as the sign to John to identify his betrayer, as we see in John 13, 26. In the Jewish culture, offering a piece of bread during a meal was a gesture of special affection and friendship, as well as an act of reconciliation. Judas should have responded by dipping a piece of bread in the dish 
and give it to Jesus in return. Even at this late time, Jesus offered Judas an alternative to betraying him. Instead, Judas rejected the offer of friendship and left the room. It was the greatest insult to reject this offer of friendship, John 13, 18. The rejection showed that Judas had irreversibly made his mind up to betray Jesus and when, sent to, uh, when Satan entered into him, um, Jesus said to Judas, do quickly what you're going to do. The remainder of the disciples would not have heard the conversation and would not have known why Judas had left the room in, in John 13, 28. And Peter must have been sitting on uh, one of the side couches, probably across the table from John and not next to Jesus. And that's why he had made a gesture to John requesting him to ask Jesus to identify the betrayer. You guys still with me? Okay. Picking it up in Matthew 26, verse 47. It says, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the 12, arrived. They're now at the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, with him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent, for them, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now, the betrayer had arranged a signal with them the one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judah says, greetings, rabbi. There it is again. Never called him Lord. And kissed him. Jesus replied, do what you came for, friend. The men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions, and we know it's Peter, reached for a sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Here's a misconception that I want to clarify. You know, at church, we sing that song. Uh, he could have called. I'm not going to sing. That's not my gift. But Yes, he could have called 12,000 angels. That's the lyrics. The truth is a Roman legion consisted of about 6,000 soldiers. So 12 legions would have met 72,000 angels. Now, it only took one angel to kill uh, 185,000 Assyrian soldiers if we look at 2 Kings 19.35, uh, which I won't read. When Judas, who had betrayed him so that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. And this was uh, a messianic prophecy. And, you know, it did say that... Um, uh, Jesus would have been uh, betrayed by 30 pieces of silver, as we will see in a moment. But in Exodus 21, 32, it says this, but if the ox gores a slave, either male or female, the animal's owner must pay the slave's owner 30 silver coins and the ox must be stoned. So this was actually an insult because Jesus to the Jews was the price of an injured slave. I mean, could you imagine? Jesus, the Lamb of God, the Son of God, to the Jews, he was equivalent to that of a slave that's gored by an animal. That was the price you had to pay to the owner for having your animal do that to someone else's slave. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. The chief priest picked up the coins and said, it is against the law to put this into the treasury since it is blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it, is, it has been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. Again, this was a fulfillment of a messianic prophecy. 
they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price set for him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. And here is what it would have looked like. This is at Kodama, uh, the field of blood. And so it would have been in this area that it happened. Um, Judas's suicide happened close by. Let's look at some more prophecy. In Micah 5, 2, it reads, but you, Bethlehem, Bethlehem means house of bread. And it's interesting that the bread of life, Jesus in John 6, 35, was born in the house of bread. Um, Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me, one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. So that's the prophecy. Here's the fulfillment in Luke chapter 2, verses 4 to 7. And because Joseph, Jesus's earthly biological father, was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth, where Jesus was raised, in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, town of David. Prophecy fulfilled. So this is what a manger would have looked like. Um, Stone was very common in Israel. While they did have some wooden mangers, uh, most of them were made of stone. However, none of the wooden mangers have been preserved over time. However, the stone ones did. So we know that there was no room for uh, Mary and Joseph at the end. I'll just uh, read you this. The word often translated as in here is more appropriately understood as meaning a guest chamber. Instead of being turned away from a full inn, say like a holiday inn or something of that sort, it rather seems that Joseph and Mary were denied proper hospitality by their own relatives. It's possible that instead of hosting them in the guest room, they forced the couple to stay in a lower room, such as this one, where the family's animal slept. Again, this is all happening in Bethlehem. Very interesting. Nearby, um, in Bethlehem, next to this scene here, in Luke chapter 2, it says there were shepherds in the field nearby. Again, still Bethlehem, keeping watch over their flock. Um, a, common, a common argument against December 25th, possibly being the actual birth date of Jesus, is the weather, since a cold night in winter didn't make a comfortable time for shepherds to be tending their sheep in the field. However, during nights in Bethlehem, um, they aren't always cold. This picture was taken on Christmas morning, and the flock's shepherd had spent the night outdoors with them. So what's interesting here is that I'm move to this side. What's interesting here is that this is all in Bethlehem, and all the Passover lambs had to come from Bethlehem. So on one side, you had the lamb of God, and on the other side, you had the lambs for God, the sacrificial lamb of God on one side, and all the general Passover lambs that they would sacrifice for God on the other. Again, it's ironic how all the lambs were uh, born, raised, and bred in Bethlehem. So a Passover lamb, it actually came as a command from God in Exodus chapter 5. It reads, your lamb shall be without blemish a male, a year old, 
Uh, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. So the male, uh, the lamb had to be male without blemish, uh, no blemishes whatsoever. And so that was a Passover lamb, but let's look at the Passover lamb and let's see how Jesus fulfilled this. So Jesus is a male and he was declared without sin by even non-believers. Okay, in Pilate, uh, Pilate in Luke chapter 23, verses 4 and 14, he says, I find no basis for a charge against this man, even Herod in Luke 23, 15. Um, neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. And we even see the thief on the cross declaring Jesus as innocent. He says in Luke 23, verse 41, we are punished justly for we are getting what our sins deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. So these men were unknowingly, ironically, declaring that Jesus was worthy of being the Passover lamb. I mean, how amazing is that? Most scholars believe this is where it happens. This is Herod's palace uh, during the time of the Passover. So many of these scenes that we've read and will be reading uh, might have taken place here, including his trial. This was, it was in this complex that Jesus was stripped and, and, and mocked, okay? Herod's complex. Now, I want to share some other interesting striking parallels. You guys remember The Passion of the Christ by Mel Gibson? So, on the left of your screen, that's the actor Jim Caviezel, who played uh, Jesus in The Passion of the Christ. And to the right, that's him in character, getting some direction from Mel Gibson. Take a listen. The woman who played the role of Jesus's mother, Mary, was actually pregnant. Mel Gibson noticed her wobbling a little bit on the set and brought it to her attention and she admitted that she was indeed pregnant. Now, Jim Caviezel, who had the lead role, had a conversation with Mel over the phone because Mel Gibson actually tried to talk him out of it because of the potential backlash, because not everyone was on board with the movie. And Mel told him that he may never get another role. He may um, never get another job. His career could end before it actually began. And Jim's conviction was like, look, my initials are JC and I'm 33 years old. Pretty much God wants me to do this movie. And Mel Gibson was like, stop, you're, you're freaking me out. Also, during the scene, uh, if the scourging, the soldier actors had to hit this vertical post behind Jim to make it look like it was hitting Jim. In one instance, the soldier missed and hit Jim in the back and actually created a gash on the actor's side. And they ended up using the actual injury in the film. On another occasion, um, during the scene where he was carrying the 130 pound cross, he was supposed to fall and one of the soldier actors was supposed to catch the cross and he didn't. So the cross actually fell on the actor's head when he hit the ground. And he said how both fake blood and real blood began to flow from his mouth. Now from the various see, uh, cross scenes with the different falls and drops, he actually dislocated his shoulder several times. During the scene when he was up on the cross, uh, it was cold, uh, it was a windy day and everyone and the cast had their jackets and their hats on and poor Jim had to hang uh, there uh, on the cross with just his loin cloth. And just in case you were thinking it couldn't get any worse, during the scene, there was a lightning storm. Um, people looked at Jim and some hit the ground. Some women started screaming because smoke was coming from both sides of Jim. He had literally been struck by lightning and the injuries he sustained uh, during that film led him to having heart surgery. 
Now here's some other interesting things. Mel Gibson said that the whole time, Jim never complained. He was patient. Jim was convinced that God wanted him to experience just a little bit of what Jesus actually went through. And he was willing to humbly accept that calling, knowing the impact this movie would have on so many lives. And Jim would have to sleep in his makeup and his costume because of the many hours it took to put it, it on. I mean, the work that goes into making these costumes is just hours upon hours. So these guys were lucky even if they got three hours of sleep. And one day a cast member, he was having his coffee and he was smoking and he literally bumped into Jim while Jim was still wearing the bloody and scarred costume. And the actor was so shocked that he dropped his coffee mug, he dropped his cigarette and he was standing there frozen for about 30 seconds. He couldn't move, he couldn't talk. He was like a deer in headlights because he couldn't believe that someone could be so disfigured. And while Jim had a costume on, we know that Jesus did not have a costume on. He was actually marred, um, beaten, whipped beyond human comprehension. And if this actor could be stunned by a costume, I could imagine what it looked like seeing Jesus in his actual um, torn form. Let's keep looking at the Lamb of God here. So a Passover lamb in Exodus 12, verse 6, it says, um, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. So lambs had to be slaughtered at twilight. That's between two evenings. Before nightfall, um, the ninth hour, which is three o'clock or 3.30, but no later than 5 p.m. And in Matthew 27, verse 45 to 46, it reads, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So Jesus was crucified by the sixth hour, um, 12 o'clock, and died at the ninth hour, approximately three o'clock. The Passover lambs were dying at the same time that the Passover lamb was dying. Also in the Old Testament, again, we're looking at prophecies. Um, in Exodus 12, 46, it says, it must be eaten inside the house. Take none of the meat outside the house. Do not break any of the bones. So they weren't allowed to break the bones of the Passover lamb. Now let's look at Jesus in the New Testament. In John 19, 32 to 33, it reads, the soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man because he was not a Paso uh, Passover lamb who had been crucified with Jesus. And then those of, actually he broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, sorry. And then those of the other, but, when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Again, fulfillment of prophecy. So this is what the actual uh, crucifixion scene would have looked like with Jesus uh, in the middle. Um, some of the artistic depictions do not show this. But this picture shows examples closer to reality with the middle cross bearing the titleless, the formal accusation of Jesus. This is Jesus, the Nazarene king of the Jews in multiple languages. Now they actually found in a tomb north of Jerusalem, they found a heel bone with a bent nail driven through it, okay? This is actually a replica because they didn't want anyone to get offended, but they actually found 
a nail driven to someone's bone. So these things aren't just stories. These things actually really happened. Another interesting parallel in Genesis chapter 22, verse two, this is when uh, uh, Abraham goes to sacrifice his son Isaac. In Genesis 22, verse two, we see that this is the first time that God uses the word love in the Old Testament. It was when Father Abraham was about to sacrifice his only son to show his own love and obedience to God. Isaac here is the lamb, but doesn't know it. That's why he asks, where is the lamb? And uh, Abraham replied, God himself will provide the lamb. And God just really told him, take your one and only son, the only son whom you love and sacrifice him. So again, the first time we see that God uses the word love it is uh, right here. And in the New Testament at Calvary, also known as Golgotha, uh, we see Mount Moriah, the same location where Abraham and Isaac was approximately 2,000 years later. It's like deja vu. Only this time, God is not saying the word love, but he's showing the word love because God the Father is sacrificing his only son. He himself, this time around, is providing and sacrificing his lamb son. So in Genesis, God's, well, it was the first time God says the word love, but we see later in Jesus, he's actually showing his love by having him die on the cross for our sins. So this is what Golgotha would have looked like. Um, people were quick to build churches and all kinds of things around the area. So this is what Golgotha looks like today. Uh, this is a tomb in which Jesus would have been um, placed in. Uh, it says only a handful of these tombs have been found in the area. This particular one is situated on Mount Carmel. Interestingly, the garden tomb, one proposed location for Jesus' burial place, was never sealed with uh, such a stone. Again, this is a sample burial place. I want to close by sharing a very interesting story which helps us to see what Jesus has done for us. So there's a story of a young man who had been raised as an atheist who was training to be an Olympic diver. The only religious influences in his life was some outspoken Christian friends. The young diver never really paid much attention to his friends' sermons, but he heard them often. One night, the diver went to the indoor pool at the college he attended. The lights were all off, but as the pool had big skylights and the moon was bright, there was plenty of light to practice by. The young man climbed to the highest diving board, and as he turned his back to the pool on the edge of the board, he extended his arms out and saw his shadow on the wall. The shadow of his body was in the shape of a cross. Instead of diving, he knelt and prayed. He prayed, and after his prayer, the young man, uh, as he stood up, he stood up, and just then a maintenance man walked in and turned the lights on. It was a good thing he did because the pool had been drained for repairs. My brothers and sisters, this is what Jesus had done for us. It says, you see, in Romans 5, 6, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. It's like that repairman. He came at just the right time where this young diver could have possibly jumped to his death. He came at the right time, switched the lights on, and it saved his life. This is what Jesus has done for us. At just the right time, he came into my life, your life, and he, him being the light of the world, turned the lights on 
and we were able to see things clearly and we didn't dive into um, impending death. So that's it, my brothers and sisters. We have crossed the finish line. Um, I, I charge you. The time has come for us to not just have Jesus as our rabbi, but as our Lord. The time has come for us to really study and, and read his instruction manual. The time has come for all of us to collectively understand Jesus. And the time is now. Amen. May God bless you all. I will now turn the floor over to, I guess, all of us. Um, you'll have the opportunity to ask uh, questions, make comments, and then Bobby will have a few things to share with us. Any questions or comments? Wow, that was awesome. Yeah, Jeff. The, um, Jeff, phenomenal job. Is, Thank okay. you. Excellent so job. Very Great job. Much. Mm. Yes, I have was. enjoyed it totally. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so the, insight you, the insight you gave us about this is so it's, it's, it's awesome. I can't wait to go over it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, too. Yeah. Yes, thank yes, you so Jeff. much, Jeff. I really appreciate all the work that you put into this. Mm -hmm. And um, it really showed. And also, it really just encouraged us to dig deeper into our Bibles. Yes. So, mm -hmm. so encouraging. Thank you. You're welcome. Amen. Mm -hmm. hey, yes, Jeff, I am Jeff. so... I am so um, in awe of this teaching. I, yeah. I've been looking every Tuesday for the last four weeks. I just look forward to this class. I've learned so much from mm -hmm. all the classes we've done, but this one, I just really moved my heart. I um, just learning, even from the very first class, Jesus' is, um, rabbinical, is that how you pronounce it? <laughs> Teach. Yes, <laughs> rabbinical teaching. Yes, and just learning all of that, and it, it it this class has made the Bible, the New Testament, and the Old Testament become come to life. Mm -hmm. I it's um it's really it really encouraged my heart. I even bought the book Understanding Jesus because the last two years I've been really digging into my Bible more and just getting to know the Bible and Jesus. So this has really catapulted me to another level. So I'm so thankful, thankful to you and um, all that you've taught and even the, the, um, all the illustrations that you've shown just to kind of put those things together. It's like, wow, I, I can't read the Bible the same because it really has put from the robe to even just the picture you just showed mm -hmm. earlier about how they lay at the table. Cause yeah, I was picturing it the way we all see it. People sitting at the table, but mm -hmm. seeing that they lay. So it, it's, this has really been one of those classes that will be imprinted on my heart for the rest of my life. Amen. And I'm gonna be learning more. So thank you so much, Jeff. And just the whole teaching ministry. This yes. is a class that I think every disciple should take or learn or do or whatever but mm -hmm. as disciples as follow of christ i think this is a class every one of us should do amen so thank, thank you nicole. jeff you're very welcome thank you for sharing that i mean oh. thank you so much jeff for you know just sh showing us this i mean even though i'm 44 i mean this is just so much insight it just inspires me to read the bible more to want to know more and I'm glad you showed us, you know, I am just so, so glad, so encouraged. Thank you so much. You're very welcome, Melanie. Thank you. Um, I'm just amazed that like the details you talked about, um, man, I just gotta go back, <laughs> but just the details and the background of, you know, what everything looked like and, how Jesus, like someone said, how his disciples actually, they actually lay down and recline because, you know, you couldn't get a picture unless somebody printed, you know, make it 
visible. So that's what I think that you did. And that's so great. I mean, this is the la- I missed the last class because my brother was in the hospital, but I'm so glad I got this last class. And I think it just was really something to it's a it's a, to me it's a higher calling to take it deeper so i'm glad you did that thank mm-hmm. you very much amen thank you for sharing that margie you're welcome hey jeff hi dave hey thank you very much bro um i in particular tonight i appreciate uh, so much you sharing your testimony and um mm. It, it, it brought me back and I want to say it, it captured um, the heart, especially when you said how you felt when you're on a subway and you looked around. You're not judging anybody, but, you know, the, the heart you, you had when you, or what you felt in that moment to want to share with others. Um, you know, it was, it was, it's always powerful hearing what, so, you know, you know someone's uh, testimony, how they came to Christ and, and things that were going on in their life. It was it was really uh, inspiring, really moving, and it was a good reminder. Um, and then also with Jim Cav- Caviezel, yeah, movie. I I'm like, what, really? <laughs> 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 wow, <laughs> you know. So that's that's pretty amazing. But you know, just for I guess you know someone's playing the role of Christ, and and wow, to go through all of that. That's that's uh, you know. And like you said, uh, he, he, you know, he was just, he just had a costume on, mm. you know, when he said he was on a, on, you know, on a cross on set, feeling the, uh, you know, the cold, the, you know, the cold, whatever, the weather, ho- however it was, you know, everybody is around him, clothed and sheltered or whatever, right? So it just really helped to, um, you know, it, 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 it helped to help me to understand better. Mm-hmm. Uh, just you know what what our lord went through what jesus went through mm. so um so thank you very much and i appreciate it bro thank you my pleasure thank you for sharing good stuff jeff i just want to say thank you it was mm-hmm. so inspiring and encouraging and uplifting and you know how the scripture talk about Jesus is the mystery? How, how the scripture talk about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to, to, to us, you know, is the power. Mm-hmm. And it just builds my faith. It just makes me more eager to 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 stay closer to God, to stay close to the Lord and grateful and humble, you know, because I feel that for me personally, God is giving me more of himself. He said lie, he said lie, you guys, my brothers and my sisters, to teach me, to show me, you know, things that you, you never, you know, really study out in depth. And to hear these lessons and the way you guys go so deep in revealing, you know, these things, it's like, wow, God, you know, to see his heart, to see, you know, how, how much he loves us to, to come from Abraham and the Old Testament and fulfilling the New Testament and how, how God worked work it out. And just mm-hmm. to reveal it to me, you know, mm-hmm. that, I take it personally, you know, that yeah. he will allow you guys to research so that I mm. can hear it, you know, so that my heart can be so filled with gratitude that he wants me to know him so intimately and the sacrifices that he made, his heart, Jesus's heart even with Judas, his patience, mm. you mm-hmm. know, that it, wow. it just blows me away. So I'm just so, so, so grateful. Words cannot express, you know, I'm in my Bible every day. I'm, I, I will stay in my Bible every day. And, and I just thank you so <laughs> much, you know, for everything, for the effort, the research, 
the research you did that I don't have to do, I can just read it mm -hmm. and pray and thank God for right. revealing these, for revealing these secrets, you know, that I I, I I never knew or overlooked or, you know, it was just too overwhelming for me. So thank you. Thank wow. you. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you for sharing, Sieta. Hey, Jeff, um, I, I'm, I'm inspired. You know, it's very encouraging how God allowed his spirit to speak to you, to help you to do uh, the, 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 uh, the research, you know, because you did a lot of work to do the research to inspire us today, you know? And I mean, you, you talking about things that I read the Old Testament, I read the New Testament and things that um, I, I, I mean, it's not explained but just research it mm -hmm. and explain it to us. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's awesome. That's great, man. Thank you. And God is good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All the time. What you did Thank is you. awesome, bro. <laughs> I'm serious. It's good. Good, good thing, bro. Good yeah. thing. Awesome. Thank you so much, Frank and Sia. Awesome couple. Amen. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. Amen. Excuse me, Jeff. I, I have a question. Um, you know that um, the picture of the bone with the nail driven through the bone? Yes. When um, I saw the Passion of Christ, but when they went in the temple, they didn't see anything. So where did that come from? Well, the nail driven to the heel bone, archaeologists from excavating different parts of Jerusalem, they, they stumble upon it. They're always stumbling upon uh, different artifacts from first century uh, Israel and the bone, um, the nail through the heel bone was just part of it. And again, this just goes to show how these things aren't just stories that, that we're reading. These things actually happened. Men okay. were crucified, you know, either yeah. for, for their faith or because of a crime they committed. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you for answering that. You're welcome, Melanie. Okay. All right, great. So if there is no other, I can't see um, if questions are being posted, but if there's none, I would like to, again, thank you. This, been, has, been, this has been an ex, uh, how can I say it? An absolute joy for me. The pleasure has been all mine serving you in this way. You guys are awesome. Keep on keeping on. And I will now turn the floor over to Bobby with some uh, further instructions for us all. Love you guys. Love Thank you. you. Amen. Thank you so much again, Jeff. Um, I, you know, I feel like tonight you just handled some really heart wrenching material. Uh, going through some of the realities of what, what happened when Jesus was sacrificed for, for us was, it, it's overwhelming, uh, but you do it with such a forward-looking voice, um, with such a, a remembrance of the hope that we have in Christ. Um, and throughout the entire series, um, it's just amazing because, you know, you so clearly did so much work to prepare this for us, but what comes out the most is just your enthusiasm and love for God and for Christ. And it, it just is, is so clear while you're speaking. So thank you again. Um, this has been a, a quite an edifying set of sessions for us. Thank you. I want to let everyone know our next three classes um, will be back in about five weeks um, with a class called Made Whole, which will be a study of James. Uh, then uh, later on in the year, we'll have a study of church history and then in 2022, our most requested class thus far has been on the ah. Holy Spirit. <laughs> and so we're, we're very yeah. excited that we, we have been working and um, starting to come up with some plans to do further study because no one on our team felt like we, we were yet in a place that we felt confident teaching on it, uh, but we're gonna get there. So that will be one of the first classes offered in 2022. Um, so thank you all again for your time and attention. We just have one request for you please, please take a moment and fill out the survey for us. Um, okay. So it, you go to tiny.cc slash GSTMS um, and you can fill out our, our survey. 
Um, and it's just so helpful for us to be able to, to gather and get feedback on our classes as we keep trying to figure out how to better serve the local congregation here. Um, so thank you, thank you all again. It's been so great uh, to, to join up with you in these nights and we look forward to seeing you again in about five weeks in August there. So thank you uh, and everybody feel free.